Well, let me just say to you, I'm glad that you're at church. I'm telling you, this is a unique season. This is a unique moment. I love how in different times, at different ways, God does different things. And this is a really special time and a really unique time. And so this last week, many of you know, many of you were part of what we called Revival Nights. Yeah, and just six nights set aside to seek the Lord and to pursue His heart, watching as miracles took place. I mean, we have gotten countless, we're actually going to create a little, little booklet, countless accounts of God meeting people in miraculous ways. And so for some, this looks like physical healing. People were physically healed of all sorts of different things. These are a bunch of the testimonies that we got. For some, uh, it looked like a renewal of their passion for God, their love for Jesus, a, a new fire in your heart, a new desire. Some people found themselves shaking under God's presence. Under, other people found themselves warm under God's peace. Some heard His voice in their hearts for the first time in a long time, or maybe the first time ever. And so just story after story after story of miracles. And I just want to affirm, I want to affirm that this is not the end of anything. It's actually the beginning of something, that God is renewing and reviving His people, that He's knitting our hearts together as a family of faith, amen, and that He's propelling us into a new way of living, a new way of living, not just a new experience in God or a new touch from God, but a new way of living. And I just want to encourage you, lean in, lean in. We're adding a service this Wednesday night, coming Wednesday night, 7 p.m., okay? All of our locations are invited, 7 p.m., just going to be a night for worship and testimony. So if you are a part of these revival nights or God's doing something profound in your heart or in your life, be a part of Wednesday night. Worship God with us, and then we're going to give some opportunity just for people to testify about how God's working and what God's doing in their lives. And so that'll be Wednesday night, and then, of course, Tuesday night in four different locations, First Tuesday prayer, 6.30. So we're going to gather, and the theme that night is going to be the Holy Spirit and renewal. So Tuesday night, Wednesday night. And then we've got Sunday night next week, baptisms. And I'm telling you, there is somebody here today that before you leave, you need to sign up for baptisms, all right? You need to sign up for baptisms. Every one of our locations at our next step table, sign up for baptism and watch God work miracles as you step out in faith, okay? And so for the next six weeks, starting today, we're going to be focusing on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? And how does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? And the Holy Spirit's given several names in the Scripture. He's called the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Life, the Helper, the Advocate, the Spirit of Glory, the Counselor, the Comforter, the Spirit of Burning, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Revelation. What I want to look at over these next number of weeks is what does it mean to live a Spirit-led life? What does it mean to live a Spirit-filled life? And you might hear those terms and maybe you grew up with someone you know or you know somebody at school or somebody in your family, that crazy uncle or that crazy aunt. You're like, oh boy, spirit-filled life. That was like the kooky guy. You know, it's like, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like a kooky guy that you used to know. I'm talking about a life that looks and models itself after Jesus. I'm talking about a life that actually embodies the same dynamic that we see in the disciples, a life that is led by the Spirit, that is moved by the Spirit, a life that is grounded and sound in Christ but is also a life of incredible miracles. And we see all through the Bible that a spirit-filled, spirit-led life looks different from the world around us. It's a life of victory over sin. Look at what Galatians 5 says. It says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so there's a power over natural impulses that would be toxic for your future, and that power comes by the Spirit. It's a life that's free from condemnation. Look at what it says in Romans 8. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Come on, somebody say amen. That's awesome. It's a life free from condemnation and the stronghold of sin. It's a life that's full of peace. Somebody in this place needs some peace, and the Spirit wants to teach you how to live a life of peace. Romans 8, 6 says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Look at that person next to you and tell them, you need some peace. Come on, just tell them, you need some peace. You know it's true. You've been all anxious about this and that. You need some peace, and the Spirit will teach you a life of peace, and it's a life of dynamic relationship with God. I love what 2 Corinthians 13 says. It says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
I love that because it doesn't say be with the most spiritual people. Be with the pastor. Be with, no, 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 no. It says be with you all. That the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of the Spirit, it's always been God's intention that your life would be marked by power. You'll receive power, Acts 1-8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so my prayer for you and for me and for our church is that over these next six weeks, God will develop in us a profound hunger for the things of the Holy Spirit and a great manifestation of His life and power. And what we see through the New Testament is that just because every believer has the Spirit, and it's true that every believer has the Spirit, you cannot be a follower of Christ without the Spirit of God within you and uh, the Spirit of God taking up residence in the heart of the believer. But just because you have the Holy Spirit does not mean that you are living in the experience of a life in the Spirit. And so we want to explore what does a Spirit-led life look like? And we'll begin that study in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you today, and I just encourage you to follow along and let these words sink into your heart because I think God has a word for the house. Verse 6, Yet among the mature we impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And none of the rulers of the age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. And these things God revealed to us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for who knows the person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept these things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he himself is judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so I want to spend the next few moments introducing us to this theme of the Spirit-led life. The Spirit-led life. Would you pray with me? Let's open up our hearts to God. God, I thank you for my friends, for my family. I thank you for the church, that you are establishing us, that you're knitting our hearts together in love. Lord, even this last week, as you knit our hearts together in the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I thank you that you're doing a new thing, that there is a fresh wind that is blowing, and we just want to be sensitive to it, and we want to be led by your Spirit. So teach us the secrets of a Spirit-led life. We open our hearts to you today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. You have a reputation to protect. You have a reputation to protect. Everybody wants to look good. Everybody wants to look like they know what they're doing, right? Nobody enjoys looking like an idiot, looking stupid, looking foolish, looking like you don't know what's going on. You have a reputation to protect. I'm maybe particularly sensitive to this right now because I have a ninth grader and a seventh grader. And if you go back in time, maybe you are a ninth grader or a seventh grader, but if you go back in time and you remember what it was like to be in middle school or to be in your first year of high school, you remember that that's a time where you are heightened to the awareness that you have a reputation to protect, right? You just want to fit in. You want to look like everybody else. You want to talk like everybody else. It's such a time of, of, of identity tension where it's like, oh, how do I fit? Who am I? Where's my spot in the order of things? And and, and I know that that's a time where, where we're tested in this, you know, and for me, I can remember very clearly in eighth grade grow, going through a bit of a, of a crunch when it came to my reputation, my identity, having to really be tested in my confidence. And I remember it really started for me when I made the middle school basketball team in eighth grade which for me was a big deal because I was a passionate basketball player and they kept 20 kids on the team. But for whatever reason, I don't know if it was budget cuts or what the deal was, but they only had 12 uniforms, all right? And so the 12 best kids got the uniforms and the other eight kids were told that there were some old uniforms in the locker room. And so I was one of the eight kids and, and I was led into the locker room and we opened up this big box. I can see this moment in my mind so clearly. Coach Sacramone saying, well, why don't you go over and, and go, to the, go to the locker room? And I went there and we opened up the box and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh no, this is not good. Because every jersey and pair of shorts in there had to be from 1968 or, late, or earlier. 
all right? And so the, the shorts were about this long, and the, and the jerseys were skin tight. And for an eighth grade kid, this is an absolute nightmare. I have to go out looking like a fool. My boxer shorts are hanging out by four or five inches on both sides. And, and here we are all just walking out. And the worst part for me is for whatever reason, I got stuck with the number five. You're like, well, who cares? Well, what matters is that there was another kid with the new jerseys that already have the number five. So we had athletic tape and we made me 15, all right? And so now I don't just have a ridiculous jersey with a ridiculous pair of shorts. I have this swanky, janky number 15 that I've got to go wear, which wasn't that big of a deal since I sat on the bench 99.9% .9 of the time and never really played. But it was a big deal for me because I had a reputation to protect. The only benefit of eighth grade basketball was that I looked a lot like the best kid on our team. And so frequently people would come up to me in school and be like, hey man, you scored 20 points this last game. And I'd be like, well, you know, it was a tough game, man. You know, like I wouldn't tell them like, ah, I, I didn't even play at all because I wanted to protect my reputation. And so do you. We all do. The natural person longs to protect our reputation, right? And so here Paul starts to contrast the natural person and the spiritual person and that there is this thing inside the natural person that is led along by our senses. And this is not a bad thing, but the natural person discerns life through what we see, what we perceive, what we feel, what we understand. We use logic and reason and history and science. And none of that is bad, by the way. It's just incomplete. That there's a part of you that the natural person cannot meet. That there is a spiritual part of you. And it's urgent that you begin to see, walk, and live by the Spirit. See, the natural person wants to see themselves as capable. And it wants other people to see them that way. The natural person wants to be competent, wants to build a resume, wants to prove myself, wants to carve out a place for myself in the world, wants to be successful and accomplish something and be celebrated and be comfortable and feel like I matter and I'm in control of my life, to have the sense of value and worth from the affirmation of others. The natural person might embrace faith, but not to the point of completely losing control. I still want to hold on to things. And so Paul says that the natural wisdom of this world is not useless. Instead, I don't know if you caught it in the text, he said it's passing away. In other words, it has its limits. It can't get you all the way there. There's not that it's all bad, but it's that you need something more. It's not eternal, and it doesn't answer the deepest questions and the biggest questions of life. And so history shows us that the natural mind has value, but often is outdated even in one generation. For example, you look at someone like Thomas Edison, a brilliant individual in his generation. But Edison was convinced that an airplane would never fly, that a heavier than air machine would never take off. Now, years later, we look back and we say, what an idiot. No, 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 Edison wasn't an idiot, he was brilliant. He was just living in his age and his knowledge is outdated just a generation later. Now, natural knowledge is always progressing, but spiritual knowledge is eternal in nature. It's rooted in something beyond the natural world. And so if you live your life, and many Christians do, by the way, simply with the natural mind, what you'll find is you will always reach limits that won't get you to the fullness of life. And so those limits can be seen everywhere. Let me illustrate them physically, okay? They can be seen in small things. For example, in the understanding of the atom, right? When you look at the atomic level, you might not be a scientist or care about this stuff, but you know from high school, you go, okay, Adam, yeah, there's a proton, a neutron, an electron, right? And you know that scientists study the electron, they discovered that it is a particle until it's a wave, right? And they realized, wait, sometimes the electron seems to be a wave, and sometimes it has the properties of a particle. How can it be a wave and a particle that's contradictory to everything we know about reasoning, everything we know about logic, everything we know about science? It can't be both. And so we come up with a principle that scientists call Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which basically says of the electron, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what it's doing. It's defying our logic. It's defying our reason. We don't know why it's doing that. But when we name it something, it makes us feel better. So let's call it the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? Because that helps us feel like we're in control. And you see this same problem as we zoom out and we look at the cosmos, right? We look at the planets and, and all the stars and we say, oh, we understand all of that. Do we though? Do we understand all of that? Because today scientists will tell you that about 95% of what's out there is what they call dark matter or dark energy. And you know what we know about dark matter and dark energy? Not a whole lot. And so that tells us that about 5% of the known universe we have a sort of kind of glimpse of, and the other 95% is 
is pretty much shrouded in mystery. And this is always the struggle of the natural mind. We like to pretend like we're in control, like we figured things out. Well, thank God for the internal combustion engine and for penicillin, and we got a few things figured out, but there is tons of stuff that is still a wonder and a mystery. And we can't find the deep answers to life. We can't find answers to why am I here? What's my purpose? Where's God in all this? What happens when I die? But Paul tells us that the problem goes deeper, that it's not just that the natural mind has limits and that the wisdom of the natural mind has limits. It's also that the natural mind blinds you to the things of the spirit, that there's something inside of you from your natural self that causes you to be unable to see the things of God. And it's that something that exists in every human heart that keeps you from seeing the spiritual reality that is so evident all around us. And that something, Paul tells us, is pride. You might be here too and you're like, well, I don't deal with pride. Well, that's because you're blind, <laughs> right? It's because you're blinded to it. It's because you don't see it. It's because you're not aware of it. Every single human heart is in a wrestling match with pride, even if they don't realize it. See, pride manifests in a thousand flavors, in a million different colors. Pride looks different for every person, and it has a way of hiding, of sneaking in, of being the thing under the thing. And so pride can look like a thirst to be recognized. It can look like a desire to be in control. It could be a longing to be adored, a desire to justify myself in front of others, an unwillingness to be generous, a need to uh, uh, not trust someone fully, a hesitancy to say, I'm sorry, a hypersensitivity to need to look like I'm a really good person. Pride, we're told, is the first sin, and it's the root sin behind all sins, and it blinds the natural man from seeing life as it truly is. And so pride is so powerful, we're told, that people stood in front of Jesus, who Paul here calls the Lord of glory, and rather than recognizing him for who he is, pride blinded them to such a degree that they shouted, crucify him. In other words, you can stand right in front of God, he can be right in front of your face, and pride can blind you from seeing that truth. Incredible. I love how this is illustrated in Matthew 28. It's always shocked me and stunned me, but it manifests this truth of pride and how powerful it is. We're told that Jesus dies. He rises from the dead. He spends 40 days with his disciples. They put their hands in his scars. He tells them about the coming kingdom. And then we're told in Matthew 28, he's about to ascend into heaven. And it says, and they bowed down on the mountain. They worshiped him. But some doubted. And you're like, wait, what? Nobody doubted. If God gave me a dream in the night, I would never doubt again. If God gave me a vision, I would never doubt again. If God spoke to me audibly, I would never doubt again. If God broke through the clouds, I would never doubt again. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. You might not think that you would, but that's pride that tells you you wouldn't doubt again. And you would doubt again because something inside of us has a proclivity towards this doubt. The natural man, in all his wisdom, cannot see God. And that's what's so exciting about the gospel is that through Jesus Christ, God has launched humanity into a divine opportunity to experience him and give us a wisdom beyond ourself. And that wisdom was unlocked for us through the cross, that Jesus Christ came, God came in flesh, foolishness to the natural mind. He lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death, rose from the dead, and then put within all those who believe his Holy Spirit, so that now on the inside of the believer, there is a channel between heaven and earth. These things he has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is that conduit that enables you to understand what life really is. And so we see the truth of the Spirit being manifest amongst the people. And this is what makes the church such a unique place, such a profoundly unique place. Let me try to illustrate this for you. Here's a little history lesson. January 8th, 1902, two trains collided in Westchester County, New York. 15 people died in this train collision, and it sparked national outrage because the population of New York had exploded, transportation was a mess, and nobody was willing to invest in fixing 
the problem. And so this tragic collision led the Vanderbilt family, a very wealthy, influential family in New York, to build a new train station in New York City, which would eventually have 44 platforms and 100 tracks and become the largest train station in the world. You and I have, all, most of us have been there. It's called the Grand Central Station, right? And the Grand Central Station is amazing for a lot of reasons, but one thing that is incredibly amazing about the Grand Central Station is that it's invisible, that all 44 platforms are underground, right? And so you can't see it with your natural eye, but it's there. It's there. And so in the same way, 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, there was a tragic collision between the Son of God and the sin of the world. And that collision led to the construction of a new terminal in the heart of every believer, a grand central station that though it is invisible, now gives you access to the things of heaven. And that terminal is in fact the Spirit of God in you, that you have the Holy Spirit and He wants to show you the things freely given us by God. But just because you have the terminal doesn't mean that you're on the train. It doesn't mean that you're accessing the things of the Spirit. So beware of being a spiritual man, but living in a natural way. Beware of having the Spirit, but not operating in the Spirit, of never learning a Spirit led life. And I believe that's where God's taking our church right now, is that he wants to push you into a new level of understanding. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? What does it mean to be a spiritual person? And it doesn't just mean that I occasionally read the Bible or ask God for help. It is a new dynamic of living, a new philosophy of living, a new perspective on living. The natural man tries to build a resume, but the spiritual man tries to build God's kingdom. The natural man seeks his own comfort, but the spiritual man lives a cruciform life, a life that's been redefined by the shape of the cross. The natural man sees money as his source of security and freedom, but the spiritual man sees all money as belonging to God and as a divine stewardship. The natural man sees marriage as a means of self-fulfillment, and the goal is happiness, but the spiritual man sees marriage as a means of self-sacrifice, and the goal is holiness. The natural man sees time as something that belongs to him, and he needs to control, but the spiritual man sees time as something that belongs to God, that ultimately God is in control of. The natural man might pray, but he never relinquishes the idea that he is his own source, where the spiritual man has forsaken self sufficiency and lives fully convinced that God is his source. And so right now, God is calling you to abandon the ways of the natural, not because they're altogether bad, but because he has a higher reality for you. And it's the way of the spirit. Come Lord Jesus, stir our hearts. So what does it look like to live a spirit filled, spirit led life? I want to paint a picture just for a couple minutes here. I want to paint a picture for you today. And I want to give you three Three concepts, three perspectives on how to live a spirit-led life. The first is a street called wonder. The second is the front door called grace. And the third is the living room called humility. So if you want to leave a, live, live a spirit-led life, it requires that you walk down a certain street, that you enter through a certain door, and that you remain in a certain room. Let me show you. Verse 9. But as it's written, why... What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. That is a wonderful verse. It is a verse full of awe. I mean, just think about what it's saying. You can't even imagine how much he loves you. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared. What God has prepared. You think of your most wild concept of heaven. You think of your most wild concept of living a life full of faith in the miracles of God. And it's not even a fraction of what God has prepared. You can't even imagine. You know, somewhere along the line, we lost our sense of wonder. Did you notice that? Through all of our entertainment, We've all seen a thousand buildings explode and a thousand car chases. We've all traveled the world through television. And somewhere along the line, we misplaced a sense of awe and wonder. And now, no matter what happens, we go, ah, I've seen that before. I got a cousin who can do that. Like there's just something about our world that is wonderless and lacking all sense of awe. There's nothing sacred anymore. Everything's been sterilized. Everything's been explained. 
Now, that's not true, but that's the way we often live. A number of years ago, I was invited to go to an exhibit um, called Bodies Revealed, and it was an exhibit of human beings that had died who were opened up, and you could see the insides of, the, of a person. And I remember as soon as I walked in, I was like, I don't want to be here. This doesn't, I don't want to be here. And, and, and I didn't make it very long, but there was, a, there was a woman who was pregnant, and you could actually see the, the child in her womb. And I, I just thought, listen, you know, I'm not saying that doctors shouldn't understand this stuff, but it is not for me to look at a person as though it were a test case. This is just, this is a human being. This is Imago Dei. This is the image of God. There's some, some things in life that need to be treated sacred. There's some things in life that need to be treated honorably, that need to be treated holy, and, and there's something wrong. And I realized, like, how is it that this is okay with us? How is it that we've come to a place where this is, like, something that's acceptable for people to just look at like it's a science project? That's not a science project. That's an eternal soul, and, and that's a, the body of a person that had passed away, and, and I just can't, and that's not, and, 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 and I feel like, it's, how, did, how did we get here? How did we get to a place culturally and socially and economically and organizationally where we just feel like that's okay? Jesus said, unless you're converted and become like children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. He wasn't saying you have to be childish in your thinking. He was saying you have to be childlike in your wonder. You have to embody a sense of awe, a sense of wonder. See, all the things of the Spirit require a sense of wonder. The wind blows where it wishes, and so is the one who is born of the Spirit. And so you have to understand that God is going to do some crazy things. Sometimes He's going to give you a vision. Sometimes He's going to give you a dream. Sometimes He's going to lead you, but it's not going to work out the way you thought. Sometimes providence is going to organize things in the exact opposite way you planned. Sometimes all your plans are going to get smashed up against the sea, and you got to trust that He has a better plan for you. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be unorganized. It's not going to fit into some little bubble, because that's not how God works. He requires that you walk down a street called wonder, down a street called awe and majesty and glory. And friend, by the way, this is where we rediscover things like virtue, integrity, holiness, a vision for a life that is actually pure and righteous and clean. You remember that movie Braveheart where there's this scene where Robert the Bruce betrays William Wallace. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And he talks to his dad about it. And his dad says, oh, don't worry about it, Robert. All men betray. All men lose heart. And I feel like that's the anthem of an age, that we're all like, oh, yeah, you can't trust anybody. Everybody's a liar. Everybody's a cheat. Everybody's a criminal. Everybody's a crook. Everybody's got a secret life. Everybody's lying about who they really are. Everybody's deceiving. Everybody's a two-faced. Everybody's that. That's just the way it is. And Robert the Bruce fires back. He says, I don't want to lose heart. He says, I want to believe. In other words, there's people, and by the way, it's the people of God, who actually aim our lives at virtue, who actually believe in integrity, who actually trust one another towards holiness, who actually angle our lives at nobility. And we say there are values in this world that are worth living for and fighting for and dying for and believing for, and we're going to aim our hearts at being godly and honorable and holy and just and pure and true and believe that there really is nobility in this world. See, wonder is required in order for you to embody those realities, to trust in God for those things. Like a child. This past year, uh, we took my, my two-year-old daughter to Disney World. And, you know, we have three sons, but it's all different with a daughter, right? <laughs> it really is. If parents, if you have a daughter, you know what I'm talking about. It's just different. Boys, you're like, get up, suck it up. Your daughter, you're like, live in my house forever. You know, it's just different. It's just different. But, um, but uh, we get to Disney, and I'll never forget the moment. We turn the corner, and there's the castle. And Thea's eyes just light up. She looks at me. She says, oh, that's my castle. That's my castle. Because to her, it's her castle. And the awe and the wonder. And now every time there's a Disney movie on, you know, it starts with the castle. She goes, oh, that's my castle. My daddy take me there, you know, because that's, that's the way she sees the world. She sees the world through awe and through wonder and through mystery. And why don't we? Not everything can be explained. In fact, the most important things can't be fully explained like love and God and hope and peace. And God's trying to get us back to a place. And I think that's what this revival nights, these last week were all about. They were about a lot of things. But I think one of the things that they were about is that God was getting your heart back to a place 
where you started to sense that awe, that sense of, I don't know what he's going to do next. I don't know what God's going to do. God could heal the sick tonight. God could deliver the oppressed tonight. God could reveal a mystery tonight. God could overwhelm me with his presence tonight. I don't, God could save the lost tonight. I don't know what he's going to do next. That sense of mystery. A street called wonder. If you really want to understand life in the spirit, you have to restore wonder. And wonder will get you to the house, but it won't get you inside. And that's why he says in verse 12, look at it with me. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God, that we might understand the things, look at these words, freely given us by God. We might understand the things freely given us by God. That's the front door of grace. The front door of grace. Grace is maybe one of the most uncomfortable and foreign thoughts to the natural mind. I would say probably the most uncomfortable and foreign thought to the natural mind. And most Christians, I've found, spend our lives quantifying, limiting, and editing God's grace. We're not comfortable with it. Because grace says things that don't seem right to us. It seems to be beyond what the natural person can accept as kindness. Grace says that your sins are completely forever forgiven, past, present, and future, that your future sins are forgiven. Now that messes with our heads because we go, well, then what does it matter? I can just go sin. Well, actually, when you experience grace, you'll stop wanting to. And so grace forgives your past and it forgives your future. Grace says that you're accepted on the merits of Christ alone. Grace says that salvation is 100% God and 0% you, that you don't get to contribute even 1%, that even the ability to believe is grace, that the ability to accept Christ is grace, that the opportunity to repent is grace. It's all grace. Grace says you can come just as you are. And you say, no, 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 get yourself cleaned up first. Pick yourself up. No, no, no. Come just as you are, says grace. And he'll make you into who he's called you to be. See, we have a tendency to reshape grace in our own image to say, well, hold on. Let's add some qualifiers. God will be gracious if you're really good. He'll be gracious if you're super genuine, as if you even knew the genuineness of your own heart. God will be gracious if you never turn back. He'll be gracious if you never let him down again. That's how the Bible works. You got to be a good person. You got to do it all right. And then he'll bless you. Then he'll give you grace. Is that really what the Bible says at all? Or does it say by grace you've been saved, not by works? Thus any man should boast. Grace has completely removed 100% of your opportunity to boast. And it can't be grace unless it does. That's it. I love what the old theologian John Calvin said. Look at it. He said, there is nothing that troubles our consciences more than when we think that God is like ourselves. See, we limit his grace. We edit his grace. We don't accept it for what it is. And by the way, when you do, you grieve the spirit of God. You hinder the work of the spirit because the door into the life of the spirit only goes through grace. That we might understand. That's why he came the things freely given us by God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. That's why God speaks in Isaiah 55 through the prophet. Look what he says. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Check this out. He says, this is, this is the way I see things. It's different than the way you see things. Now, if you're a Christian for any length of time, you probably heard that verse before. And we usually talk about that verse when something bad happens, you know, or when we're totally confused. We're like, well, I thought I was going to get the job, but I got fired. What happened? Well, his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not. Oh, okay, yeah. So we, we, we use it in reference to his providence, which is true, but it's actually not what the verse is about. You got to read the context of the verse to understand what he's meaning when he says, my ways are not your ways, your thoughts, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He's explaining the thing that we're most likely to trip over when it comes to understanding the mind of God. And here's what comes before it. Verse 1, come. All you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come. Buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Well, that's a stupid verse. You can't buy things without money. Nothing's free in this life. There's always a catch, right? What's he talking about? Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Look at this. Let the wicked forsake their ways, the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord. Check this out. And he will have mercy on them to our God, for he will freely pardon. And then the next thing he says is, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. It's clicking for somebody. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts above your thoughts. In other words, the most challenging concept for the natural mind to grasp is the 
revelation of God's grace, of how good he really is, of how much he really loves, of how profound his love towards you actually is. And that's why Paul prayed that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened through a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you might know the riches of his glorious inheritance, friends. He loves you so much more than you've allowed him to. And when that gets in you, now you're working the world of miracles. Now you're going to experience the supernatural. There's only one other time in the Bible where this idea of as high as the heavens are above the earth is mentioned. And it connects to Isaiah 55. And it's in Psalm 103. He says this, He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Just write this on your soul today. Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Somebody here has been standing outside of a life in the spirit because you haven't walked down a street called wonder and you haven't opened the door called grace. So forsake your sin, believe in a God who is good, and receive complete forgiveness. You know, for years, when I became a Christian, I wrestled with condemnation. Maybe this is for somebody today. I always felt like I wasn't good enough. I always felt like I hadn't done enough. I hadn't prayed enough. I hadn't read the Bible enough. I hadn't shared my faith enough. I just, you know, I never, I was never enough. I was always, I was always a bad Christian. I always felt like I was a failure. I always felt like I was sinful. And God delivered me from that, from that condemnation and that shame. But the deliverance didn't come until I realized that all of my guilt and condemnation Check this out. Check this out. Don't miss this. This is huge. It's worth the price of admission right here. All my, you're like, there was no price. Well, okay. All my guilt and condemnation was actually rooted in pride. Oh, how tricky pride can be. How? How could condemnation, feeling bad about sin, be rooted in pride? Well, it was a false humility that wanted to prove my own worth. It was a false humility that wanted to earn acceptance. I wanted 5% and let God do 95%. I wanted to contribute to my salvation. I wanted to prove that I was lovely, prove that I was good enough, prove that I was acceptable. So I had to repent not just of my sin, I had to also repent of my righteousness. Because in repenting of my righteousness, what I mean is that I had to turn from looking to my good deeds as a means of self-justification. I had to turn from looking to my effort as a way of proving my love. I had to abandon any opportunity for me to take glory because it's by grace you've been saved that no one may boast. And so all boasting has been removed because every element of your life needs to be seen through the lens of grace. And so you walk down the street called wonder. You open the door called grace, and then you sit down. If you want to live the life spirit-led, sit down and remain in the room called humility. Humility. Humility might require that you look a little silly. It might require that you get down on your knees this morning before you leave church. It might require that you lift your hands or you sing a song that you don't even really sound that good singing. It might require that you look a little foolish and maybe even sacrifice some of your sense of reputation. But if you're going to have a spirit-led life, you have to maintain a teachable spirit. And this is where so many of us get tripped up. You say, oh, Justin, I, I've been a Christian for 500 years. I know all about the Holy Spirit. I, I've, I've learned everything there is to learn. I've done everything that it needs to do. And, and I think the Holy Spirit wants to show you actually that teachable, that, that, that spirit that's not teachable inside of you is hindering you from becoming what God's called you to be. And you're not in graduate school, you're in third grade, and you need to relearn some of the things of the Spirit. So verse 13 says, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So the only way to learn is to stay in the school. Question for you, do you have a teachable spirit? Are you hungry to learn the things of the Spirit? If you have a teachable spirit, if you are not sure, just ask your spouse or your best friend, and they will tell you. What's it mean to be humble? It means to come in low. It means to be a good listener. It means not to think too highly of yourself. It means to be others-focused. I love how one theologian said it. It said that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. 
It's the ability to not be consumed with yourself because you've already been consumed by the love of God. It's the ability to step beyond yourself because your thirst for affirmation has been satisfied through Christ's love. See, the humble person is so convinced of God's goodness that they no longer have to obsess over their own self-preservation. They can begin to live for others because they know that Christ lived for them. And so if you remain in the living room of humility, you can learn the mind of Christ. That's what Paul's getting at. But we have, we have the mind of Christ. He expands on that concept in Philippians 2. Look at it. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So to have the mind of Christ is to carry yourself with a profound humility that looks like God. And by the way, we've been praying a lot about revival, talking a lot about revival. Humility is the foundation of revival, right? Second Chronicles 7, if my people who are called by my name will, anybody remember? Yeah, there it is, humble themselves. Can't have revival without humility. Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So for the next few weeks, I don't want to just gain knowledge about the Holy Spirit. I want to step into an entirely different way of living. And it's not that our natural knowledge is bad, it's that God's calling you up. He's calling you into a spiritual knowledge that doesn't disregard natural knowledge, but transcends it. A spiritual knowledge that gives you wisdom, that enables you to walk in wonder and grace and humility. And discover in the process what Roman 8, Romans 8 promises, which is life and peace. Life and peace. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. <sighs> Have you lost your sense of wonder? Do you expect miracles? Are you trapped in a routine that is miracleless? Have you lost your thirst for the waters of life? Have you edited and limited God's grace? Have you been hesitant to let it be what it is, which is reckless and all-consuming and disarming? Have you limited and edited God's grace, living with a sense of shame that defines your spirituality? Have you stepped out of the living room of humility, lost a teachable spirit, and acted like you've arrived. My invitation for us this morning is to make room, to make room for the Spirit of God again, to make room for God to stir our hearts and restore in us not just a desire for a touch from God, but actually a new way of living, a new way of living that is mature, in Christ, would you walk again down the street called Wonder and ask Him to restore wonder into your heart? Would you open up again the front door of grace and receive the kindness of God by faith? And would you sit down in the living room of humility and let Him teach you, reprove you, rebuke you, change you, grow you, and guide you? I just want to invite you, as we sing in just a moment, to make room to make room. Would you bow your head? Would you pray with me today? Father, we dedicate the next six weeks to grow and learn the Spirit-led life. And I pray that you would call us back into wonder. I pray that you would manifest your fruit and your gifts of the Spirit. I pray that we would have a profound hunger to walk by the Spirit, with the fellowship of the Spirit. I pray that you teach us a new freedom from sin in that the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Lord, I pray that you revive our souls and that you launch our church into a life that is Spirit-led 
and spirit-filled. Lord, we just turn to you now. I pray, stir us up even now as we make room in Jesus' name. Let's sing, church. Thank you.